Hello and welcome to another video in the course where we are learning about business strategy, while in the first module we focus on strategic position. In the previous videos we have started to talk about macro environment of an organization, as well as industry that is surrounding every organization, and here we use Porter's Five Forces framework. Previous video was a bit longer because we went through entire Porter's model and described all five of these forces. Now, we are going to continue with Porter's Five Forces framework and based on identified forces, we will be able to distinguish between various types of industry. So we still stay on the industry level. So in the previous video, we have talked about five forces such as a uh, threat of entry, threat of buyers uh, or power of buyers. Then we have power of suppliers. Uh, substitutes and we have competitive rivalry. Now all these five are going to define what this industry is going to be about and whether it might be good for us to enter it. So let's go for market types. First of all we have monopoly. Let's go for the definition. Monopoly is formally an industry with just one firm and therefore there is no competitive rivalry. Essentially this is the type of market where buyers have no choice. They simply have to buy from this one monopolistic supplier. And this is of course a favorable situation for the supplier, not too favorable for the buyers because they simply have to accept the conditions that this one particular monopolist offers. Well, and for a company that would like to enter this market, that's a terrible situation because this monopolist is probably already well established and has a lot of resources to compete with us. So this is a very unfavorable market for us. Does this occur in the real world? Definitely yes. There are many instances, say over the past 20 or 30 years, where monopolistic market occurred. It didn't sustain for too long. Uh, there always was a disruptor within the market and it no longer is a monopolistic market. For instance, think about Microsoft and operating system. Some decades ago, simply, they simply had so much power and market share that they were considered monopolist. And well, Bill Gates, thanks to this monopolistic position, could operate within the market so well that he became the richest person in the world. As well, you have Google. I think, if I'm correct, it was in 2010 when 65% of American search market was dominated by Google. This gave Google a lot of power over setting the advertisement prices within the search engines. This was again, uh, uh, there were some clear signs of monopolistic market. You see, it's not a fault of the monopolist uh, that he, he is operating in a monopolistic market. Of course, everyone would like to do it. Nowadays, we have governments regulating it. So usually within countries, you have some anti-monopoly uh, organizations that are controlling so that one organization will not get too much power over certain market. So this was monopoly. Secondly, we have oligopoly, which is quite similar to monopoly. Within oligopolis market, this is where just a few firms dominate an industry with the potential for limited rivalry and great power over buyers and suppliers. So you see, from a buyer's perspective, there still is not too much of a choice. If you have just three players offering uh, this certain product or service, you still have a very limited choice, so not too favorable situation for you. However, for a firm that would like to enter the market, there is a bit more space than within a monopolistic market. However, in oligopoly, it heavily depends how the uh, dominant players, say two, three or four of them, are going to behave. If they decide to compete with each other, then the profitability of this industry is going to decrease a lot because they are going to spend a lot of resources on competing and of course say they will sacrifice a bit of their margins. On the other hand, if these dominant players decide to cooperate, then this market can be really profitable because they will simply um, say, okay, uh, we are within the same industry, this part of an industry is going to be for you and this part is going to be for me. Of course, we are still talking about the oligopolist market, which is not really legal or again, there, are, there is going to be government interfering with it because as we said, it's unfavorable situation for a buyer. Now, are there instances of oligopolist market in the real world? Well, yes, a few. 
Uh, imagine, for instance, iron ore market, which is dominated by few players globally. We have Vale, Rio Tionto, and BHP Bilton. So, three companies that have a large market share, and they can decide, well, are we going to compete with each other, or are we going to cooperate? If they cooperate, then they will not allow a new player to enter the market easily, and they are going to maintain their profitability. So, that was oligopolist market. Thirdly, we have hyper-competition. This occurs where the frequency, boldness and aggression of competitor interactions accelerate to create a condition of constant disequilibrium and change. Well, hyper-competition is a very common scenario nowadays within the market. We can see it on a lot of markets. Also, hyper-competition is very favorable for innovation. Here, as you have guessed for the, from the name, the companies which are within the market are going to compete a lot. They are going to do price cuts. They are going to try to innovate as well. So, hyper-competition is actually a very favorable situation for the buyer. Now, let's imagine a real-world scenario. Let's say a uh, cell phones or mobile devices industry. Now previously, say some 15 years ago, you had a very few players. We had Nokia, Samsung and LG dominating the market, so it was kind of oligopoly market. However, that changed and companies such as Apple, Samsung and Google entered this market. And you see, the market completely changed. It brought a lot of innovation. We are seeing smartphones nowadays and mobile devices are adopted to a much higher degree by average buyers than ever. So this is a clear example of hyper-competition, the mobile devices market. Fourthly, we have a market which we call perfect competition. This exists where barriers to entry are low or none. There are many equal rivals, each with very similar products or same products. And information about competitors is freely available. Uh, if you have studied economics, you already know that this is just a theory. Perfect competition uh, doesn't exist anywhere. Maybe there is one or two instances that I know about. But uh, economists have created this concept of perfect competition to uh, have an easy way to describe how uh, conditions on the market work and how processes on the market work. So its economical concept is very useful, but doesn't occur in a real world scenario. If I was to pick a real world case where there is a perfect competition, if you imagine large cities within US, say New York, Los Angeles, Washington and so on, or within Europe, London, um, oh, well, let's keep it with London, uh, you can see this in the mini caps or taxi industry. There is so much competition, so it's of course hyper competition, that you might very well describe this as perfect competition. Uh, under this industry, it's of course super favorable for a buyer because companies will again have to innovate, they will have to cut their costs to earn profits. Actually, under a perfect competition, as economists say, the only way to earn more profit, to become more profitable, is to lower the costs of production because it's a perfect competition. If I increase my price uh, that I offer to the customers, no one is going to buy from me because there are a lot of other suppliers within the market on that price where I originally was. So my buyers are simply going to switch for the other suppliers. So the only way I can earn profits is by cutting my own costs. So as we said, it's very hard to find a real world example, but it's very good to keep in mind this economical concept. All right, I think that is all from Porter's Five Forces framework. Well, what implications or why is this model useful for us? If you are a business student, I think Porter's Five Forces framework is a great option if you are going to write some assignment or a thesis. You can just take this model, take some industry, take some company to analyze and really write a good paper on it. Well, and what if you are, say, a business executive? It can help you to decide which industries to enter or leave. Really well done Porter's Five Forces framework is extremely useful when we are trying to answer this question. Or secondly, what influence can be exerted? Well, industry structures are not necessarily fixed, but can be influenced 
by deliberate managerial strategies. This is again a well-known truth, which I guess if you are a business executive, you are well aware of. So <laughs> I think that is all for the short series of two videos where we try to analyze the industry that is surrounding an organization. And in the upcoming video, we are going to still stay within industries and we are going to talk about industry life cycle, which is a very interesting topic. So I'm looking forward to see you there.